are many people who don't really understand what Christmas is really about and where it comes from. There, there are millions of atheists, agnostics, and even a lot of Christians who, who have really been misinformed as to what Christmas is, is really about. If you want to be able to share the, the true meaning of Christmas, it's vitally important to thoroughly understand its history. So uh, what, what I want to do is uh, I want to take us through a walk through the history of Christmas, its many traditions, which most of us have pretty much grown up to love. Th this you can all follow along in the dictionary, history books, world religion textbooks, the scriptures, uh, the church fathers, pretty much all the major religion, or all the different denominations will admit these things readily, some of them very proudly. Uh, let's, let's talk about the date of December 25th, first of all. You know, many, many non-believers are more than happy to point out that December 25th is not the historical birth of Jesus, and that this date is found nowhere in Scripture. They, they'll also enthusiastically go on to claim that this is not, that this really is, in fact, the, the long-celebrated birthday of numerous heathen sun gods. You know, the... In order to accurately represent the one true God of the scriptures, we need to be able to be intellectually honest and take a real careful look at the his historical and scriptural facts concerning Christmas. The, the high day of ancient sun worship historically occurred every December 25th when the sun displayed its unconquerability, when it began to rise higher in the sky following the winter solstice. Hence, uh, December 25th was celebrated as the sun's birthday. This uh, pagan religious practice was the first historical observance of uh, December 25th as being a holy day. So uh, we can go back to the, the beginning of the story and take a look at really the first Christmas. This, this story, a lot of people don't realize, it's a lot older than we think, actually begins over 4,000 years ago in the land of Shinar, also called Babylon. Genesis, he was uh, the great grandson of Noah and was the king of Shinar, Babylon. He is depicted in the Bible as both being a man of power and a mighty hunter. He, he also appears in numerous legends and folktales outside the Bible as well. It, it was King Nimrod who led the first world revolt against God after the flood when he established the Babylonian world tyranny and constructed the infamous Tower of Babel. You know, Nimrod actually married his own mother whose name was Semiramis. Nimrod's birthday was December 25th, This the same day considered by pagans to be the birth of the sun. Nimrod was pretty much adored by, by his people as a god. Con, considered by uh, many historians to have been the first sun god upon which all the other sun god legends were based upon, this Nimrod story. After God destroyed the Tower of Babel, Nimrod was, according to a lot of legends, was, was killed by Noah's son Shem. And his, uh, his body was castrated and his, his parts were spread all across the land of Shinar. After Nimrod's death, his widowed mother-wife, so-called Semiramis, she claimed that she had become impregnated by the rays of the sun. And, and later, that, that next December 25th, baby Tammuz was born. Baby Tammuz is... In the scriptures, a lot of places, too, they're worshiping baby Tammuz, weeping for baby Tam Tammuz, and God didn't like that too much. As, you know, he was, he was born again as the reincarnated sun god of Nimrod. S Samaramus also claimed that a full-grown evergreen tree sprang overnight from a dead stump, which symbolized the re-erection of the new penis of Nimrod, or in other words, the springing forth of new life. You know, on... Uh, each anniversary of his birth, every December 25th, Nimrod would visit the evergreen tree and leave gifts upon it. 
that that's where a lot of the, the Yule log comes from that they'd throw in the fire, and then the next day it would be uh, re-erected as the full tree, and the, the serpent was wrapped around it. That's where that comes from, that story of Nimrod. Uh, in Egypt, af- after God confounded the, the, na- the languages at the Tower of Babel, the, the story of Nimrod, Samaramus, and ba- baby Tammuz was spread across the earth in over 70 languages. Uh, in Egypt, Horus, the, the son of Isis, the Egyptian title for the Queen of Heaven, was born at this very same time of December 25th. In accordance with the story of Nimrod, ancient Egyptians used to bring trees into their homes for their winter solstice festivals in which children placed gifts at the bottom, you know, and Sirius the dog star, a really a representation of Anubis, was, was placed at the top of the tree. The Egyptians even dipped uh, balls in gold and silver. They, they'd cut testicles off of animals or sacrifices, and they'd hang them from their trees. It represented the testicles of their, their sun god, Ra, like a fertility kind of deal. One of the early roots of the, the modern Christmas character Santa Claus was actually the god Molech, or uh, Chemosh. Every December 25th on the ancient calendar, this is recorded in the Bible too, uh, a public child mass or, or sacrifice was held. The, the head priest would stoke this iron image of the enthroned Molech with, uh, with wood and burning pitch, and it, they'd turn it into this giant glowing red furnace. And then the people, they'd take uh, and make a long list of the desires that they wanted, and they'd recite them to their God of prosperity, you know, just before they put their infant children into the red-hot lap of the glowing red god. And he was wearing a Phrygian cap, too, just like Santa Claus, that Phrygian cap. That, that, was, uh, that was one of the caps on the statues that they had there, too. A very interesting similarity. That's actually the roots of, of the Santa Claus character. It, it kind of sick the priests would interpret revelations uh, through the, the screaming of the burning babies. So they'd get these revelations from their god through the screams of these babies. Kind of sick. In Rome, there was the, the largest pagan religion which fostered sun uh, worship in the Greek and Roman worlds at this time was the, was the cult of Mithraism. Other sun gods was supposedly born on December 25th as well. They uh, they call it the Nativity of the Sun. The, the Romans separated this winter holiday into, into several different parts. Uh, they, first, from the 17th to the 21st of December was the was Saturnalia, a riotous feast laden with drunkenness and and violent orgies. You know, second on on the on the 22nd. They had the second feast, which was uh, Sigillaria, or the, the, they called it the Feast of Dolls. When a fair was held, and dolls and other toys, mostly of earthenware, were given to children. <laughs> December uh, 25th came Brumalia, otherwise called Dies Natalis Invictisolis, 
or the, the birthday of the unconquered sun. This is when the days begin to lengthen after the solstice. So you, you see there's interchange of presence. That it's, it all rings very true of, uh, w of what kind of we see today. There's a numerous, numerous winter solstice practices involving gift giving, you know, riotous drinking, decorated trees, the, the child sacrifice rituals are practiced throughout pagan Europe. From, from tree decorated in Germany to Thor pulling the, the magical sleigh across the sky in Scandinavia, m most of the Christmas traditions we are familiar with today share these same roots with King Nimrod, really, is where it all started. Then r around 2,000 years ago, the world was, was changed forever. The one in which Moses spoke of, the son of the living God, the, the Messiah, he was born in the town of Bethlehem in the land of Israel. Interestingly, this new Messiah was the only one whose date of birth was uniquely separate from all the other pagan messiahs before him. Most historical and scriptural evidence suggests that he was actually born during the Feast of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, when the word was made flesh in, in tabernacle during the Greek dwelt among us. That, that, that actually puts the birth of the Jewish Messiah, commonly known as Jesus of Nazareth, in the month of Tishri, which would be Septemberish, uh, totally separate from the December 25th sun god birthdays. The apostles in the uh, early Christian church, they abstain from adulterating themselves against their god by participating in these ancient Babylonian sun god festivities. In their scriptures, their, their God had clearly warned them that doing such actions, in his name especially, were really an abomination to him. Look up the word abomination. church had had no desire really to adopt the the ancient december 25th sun god rituals as it was very content and it's enjoying its own feast days which their scriptures instructed them to keep their messiah had demonstrated and explained the meanings of which throughout his ministry it w it wasn't even until nearly 300 years later that christianity even touched the christmas idea Oh, yep, Constantine, you know, one of the most interesting historical figures. The Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, he, can, he converted to Christianity following his battle at Milvian Bridge in 312. Uh, the next year, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, declaring the entire Roman Empire to be Christian. Despite his decrees, really, Constantine himself was a loyal follower of the new popular Roman soldiers cult from Persia, Mithraism. 
Mithraism is, uh, it's like many of the other Babylonian sun worship religions. You know, they regularly grow by absorbing and mixing in with uh, the new popular religions as they come along. When the Mithraic priests in Rome were converted to Christians at the stroke of Constantine's pen, they uh, naturally modified their Mithraic religion to adapt to the Rome's new Christian denomination. Many of the old Roman gods were just given like new Christian names, although a majority of the Mithraic religious practices and traditions re actually remained completely intact. Constantine, although you know he's Christian in name, he, he was really a follower of Mithra until the day he died. You can find bronze coins inscribed, Sol Invictus Mithra. You know, they're, they're minted by St. Constantine between the 13, uh, 13, or 313 and 326, you know, after his supposed Christian conversion in 312. St. Constantine later died in 337. You know, Mithra, the, the god of Mithraism, his birth, as were all the other Babylonian sun gods, was celebrated on December 25th. But with the new Christian denomination for the Roman Empire, the Feast of Sol Invictus Mithra was then celebrated in honor of the new Christ. You know, so they just switched it from Mithra to Christ, you know, just the name. The, uh, the first mention of December 25th is being celebrated as the date of Jesus' birth is found, I think, in early Roman uh, calendars from 336. You know, judging by Constantine's edicts, he seemed to kind of uh, favor... Mithraism more than he seemed to favor the Christian church in a lot of ways by his laws. He issued a lot of really strict edicts banning all the Hebrew feasts and weekly Sabbaths, you know, which Jesus and his apostles and the early church had all kept. But anyone who went against uh, Constantine's edicts and tried to do any of these things, which uh, they sounded Jewish, you know, they, uh, they suffered greatly sometimes under penalty of death. Uh, so soon thereafter, the removal of the Hebrew scriptures from the hands of the lay people, which uh, the Hebrew scriptures strictly prohibit the practice of paganism in the face of God, especially. I mean, uh, just removing those scriptures helped to quell any opposition to the melding of paganism with Christianity that, that took place later on, you know. Christmas was uh, celebrated pretty much after that as the birth of Jesus by most of the church. For a long time, pretty much until the, the reintroduction of the scriptures in the native tongues during the Reformation. <laughs> Christmas before the, the late 1800s was really wild. I mean, you had violence and drunkenness, riotous, you know, rioting, uh, widespread orgies, pretty much echo to the holiday's ancient pagan roots. There, there were even times the, the midwinter bash got so out of control that Christmas, in many cases, was totally banned when uh, Oliver Cromwell and his Puritan forces took over England in 1645. They, they vowed to rid English of decadence, and as part of their effort, they outlawed Christmas. You know, later, by popular demand, Charles II was restored to the throne, and with him came the return of the popular holiday. A lot of people are kind of surprised also uh, to learn that Christmas was not a popular holiday in early America. Uh, the, the pilgrims, you know, they're in, the English separatists that came to America in like 1620. They were well aware of the chaotic behavior associated with Christmas back in Europe. You know, from like uh, 1659 to 1681, the celebration of Christmas was actually outlawed in Boston. Anyone exhibiting the Christmas spirit was fined five shillings. Uh, you know, even it, Congress was in session on December 25th in 1789, the first Christmas under America's new constitution. Christmas wasn't even uh, declared a holiday, a federal holiday, until June 26, 1870. It, it wasn't until a lot later when uh, you had a lot more corporate advertising from companies like uh, Coca-Cola and popular and these popular poems came out like the night before Christmas. These, these things had a huge influence on the tone of Christmas in modern America. Uh, you know, Christmas today in America has become centered on materialism, really, where the main focal point of the holiday is on fulfilling, you know, the dream of more stuff. 
many argue that this is not the case. However, one needs only to measure the levels of enthusiasm expressed in children, you know, for the Christmas's different components. I mean, all you have to do is go ask a child on Christmas what he's so excited about, and, and he'll quickly, uh, you'll quickly learn that his glowing eyes are all about the, the Nintendo Wii or the, the new uh, Tickle Me Elmo, you know. Whatever kids may be trained to say by their parents or pastors, this is the real fruit, the real proof of the pudding, you know, watching their enthusiasm. I'm going to try to be as gentle as possible on this here. There, there's a lot of really, really good, loving Christian people who really sincerely do love the Lord. They've, they've never heard of these things. They've never studied the historical origins of these traditions. Um, I, I don't want to come down too hard on anybody, but, but now considering the unprecedented falling away from the church in atheism, it is vitally important that we check ourselves. We, we have to come to grips with the reality of this issue. Con continuing to associate our Messiah with these ancient heathen practices and, and some of these ridiculous fairy tales is only really accelerating this falling away from the church, especially with the youth. This new generation is, is not investing its heart and soul in what it perceives to be an obsolete fiction that demands their attention. You know, the, the Christian church today doesn't have the monopoly on our attention that it used to have maybe more than 50 years ago. The church today is competing with a entertainment-saturated type society where these old fairy tales are not going to really cut it anymore. They're going to have to come to grips with and embrace the reality of who Jesus really was, rather than insisting that the lies we inherited from our fathers are somehow true. It, it is an irrefutable historical fact that Christmas, its, its date of December 25th, the decorated tree, the majority of its traditions, are a continuation of Nimrod's Babylonian winter solstice sun worship festivals that, that were later modified to engulf and absorb Christianity into itself. You know, however well-meaning quoting the soundbite that Jesus is the reason for the season may be, that soundbite really has become atheist rocket fuel. And also, if you, if you just consider the facts and the reality, it is that, that soundbite is also bearing a gross false witness against the true Son of God, in luring him to the same level as the sick, twisted heathen sun gods, which his people continuously battled with throughout the entire scriptures. I, I mean, any kid with the ability to read can quickly pick up an encyclopedia or a world religion textbook and quickly learn that the focal point of the entire Christian year has been st stolen directly from ancient paganism. I mean, millions of young people who learn these historical facts, that they quickly assimilate Jesus with all the other sun gods, thanks in part to the unwitting insistence of the various denominations that Jesus is the reason for the season. And children of this generation aren't settling with fairy tales anymore. They're discarding them. Due to our repeated stubbornness in our adulteration with this Babylonian paganism over the centuries, Jesus is now perceived by a majority of Christians to be a fairy tale. I mean, if you study the polls asking Christians, even pastors, what they really believe, you'll see what I'm talking about. Christianity has become a cultural feather in the hat. You know, like a dash of color or a family heirloom. God to most Christians is no longer a reality, as proven by our disobedience to God's most fundamental requirement that we do not commit adultery against him with other gods. The bride of Christ needs to be faithful to her husband. Many people ask, why would we tie the birth of our Messiah to the birth of the ancient Babylonian anti-Messiah, and then 
unwittingly follow in the shadows of his ancient child sacrifice rituals in the, in the entire catastrophe. So we need to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? Well, we should no longer leave it up to our wild imagination to decide for ourselves what Jesus would do. We, we need to consider the scriptures and see what did Jesus do. We don't want to rationalize and conjure up excuses anymore. We, we want to walk in truth. So let's ask ourselves the question, what did Jesus do? Did Jesus ever celebrate Christmas himself? No, he, he was a Jew. He kept the feast instructed by his father. If you read through the Gospels, you'll see how Jesus actually expounded on the feast. Many of his greatest sermons were done at his father's feasts. The only thing Jesus celebrated in December was Hanukkah. When choosing how to live as Christians, we should follow his example. Jesus celebrated, taught, and lived his father's feasts. So let's ask ourselves another one. Would Jesus ever celebrate Nimrod's birthday of December 25th by symbolically re-erecting the symbol of Nimrod's cut-off penis in the form of a fir tree? Obviously not. But the reality is most Christians today do. A, a lot of people have, have the reply, you know, but, but that's not what Christmas means to me. It doesn't matter where these things come from as long as we do it for the Lord. But unfortunately, that excuse has been tried before. Remember the, remember the golden calf below Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 32? Aaron gathered up all the gold and, and the earrings and the, and the rings and all the jewelry, and he fashioned together this golden calf, and then he made the specific pro proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. How did God respond to this pagan holiday done in his name? He was furious. He wanted to wipe out the entire camp. But he, God ended up having mercy on the camp. And it only ended up costing the lives of uh, 3,000 men. And, and don't forget that this generation didn't get to enter into the promised land. No, Jesus warned us that we error and that we do not know the scriptures. Let's consider another scriptural example of this. Um, remember when King Saul lost the kingdom for attempting to offer up to the Lord only the very best of what he had recovered after conquering the Amalekites, after being clearly instructed to destroy every last vestige of paganism from the land. God doesn't appreciate these kinds of offerings. It has been written over and over and over and over again. How many times will it take for us to remember it? Some people, um, when you talk about these things, they'll, they'll have another excuse that you'll hear is, but I have little children. Okay, now we have to, we have to sit and, and think this one through. So we would knowingly teach our children to celebrate the birthday of the Babylonian sun god by observing Nimrod's phallic evergreen re-erection ceremonies and then put them through the watered-down shadow pictures of ancient child sacrifices, all in the name of our Lord? And that's not it. I mean, then we're going to completely ignore all the feasts that God put into place, all the holidays that teach us about his love, because we don't want to look Jewish. Others even say, you know, well, I don't want to cause a ruckus with my parents, you know. Well, let's listen to what Jesus says. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I mean, are we going to follow the world or are we going to follow God? The scriptural metaphor for this is the broad and the narrow path. I mean, are we going to follow the, the majority of the world and just go down the broad path, the easy path. Don't make a ruckus. Just follow along what everyone else does. We're going to have lots of company, but the path leads to destruction. Or are we going to turn aside and follow the shepherd up the narrow path? Not very many people coming with you, but you're following the shepherd. And that path leads to everlasting life. So now that we know these things, 
we have to make the choice of who we love more. God and his word, or his enemy, Babylon the Great. The one in whom we obey is the one in whom we really love. You know, the, the hard part about delivering this particular message is that after you deliver these facts and people do the research and they find out their history and they ask their pastors if these things are really so, and they come to the same conclusions, they know the reality, but they just can't make it past that blinking pine tree they love so much. And then they turn their back on God. Unfortunately, this is a message that today has to be delivered. There's just too many young people falling away from the faith because they think that their Messiah is a sun god. When he is not a sun god, he is completely and beautifully unique from all the Babylonian anti-Messiahs. We don't want to bear false witness against our God anymore. We don't want to commit adultery against our Father anymore. And I am confident that if people just find out who the Messiah really was, rather than cleaving to the lies handed down to us by our forefathers, they're going to find out that that God is much more beautiful. Messiah warned us that following him is not going to make us popular. A lot of people have the misconception that if you really, if you really love Jesus and you follow him, that life is just going to be a wonderful experience. But he actually warned us of the contrary. But he gives some encouragement as well. He said, stand up for me against world opinion, and I will stand up for you before my Father in heaven. If someone claims, I know him well, but doesn't keep his commandments, he's obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we are in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life that Jesus lived.